John uh, for the nice introduction. I've learned a few new things about myself. Um, <clears throat> so, um, well, thank you, Mike, uh, Meg and Sarah, and also the organizing committee for inviting me to be here. Uh, and you know, as John said, I'm over uh, to the dark side, uh, but but I still have a very deep interest in language assessment, uh, and I'm continuing some of my work uh, in my new role. Um, so you're going to be stuck with me for about an hour on what can be a very dry topic, uh, and actually. I myself dozed off on the train coming here, uh, you know, when I was supposed to be thinking about what I was, what I was going to say. But on the other hand, is this is also a very energizing topic because this is so core to what we do on a daily basis. So I hope at least some of you will walk away uh, with stimulating thoughts about the importance of construct definition and how that Im might impact test design and validation. So if we think about construct, uh, it's really the most complex and the most elusive concept, I would say, in language testing. And we all sort of know what it is, and we talk about it uh, as part of our daily lingo every day, right? But we can't really put our finger on it. Um, is it in our brain? Is it, you know, you know the, the performance of the task itself? or is it jointly constructed by participants? And obviously different uh, meanings have been attached to this concept of uh, construct, uh, including the task-based approach by uh, you know, our, my colleague here, uh, which basically characterizes the construct as performance of the task itself, and I think uh, John wrote a new chapter uh, in 2016 uh, which actually elaborated on uh, the, really the, the whole task-based approach to language assessment. And also the, instruct, the um, uh, ability uh, interaction approach by uh, Bachman, uh, and the minimalist interactionalist approach by uh, Kara Chappelle uh, back in the 1990s, uh, which basically defines construct as a meaningful interpretation of observed behavior. Uh, and the moderate uh, interactionalist approach by Shahab Devel, uh, and the more extreme um, interactionalist approach by He and Yang, uh, which basically uh, arg you know, argues that the construct is jointly uh, constructed by all participants. So in the task-based approach, uh, you would want the characteristics of task tasks to correspond to those of the real world tasks. Uh, and in that approach, the sampling of the domain is particularly important. Uh, and also the correspondence between task characteristics and domain task characteristics is important. In the trait-based approach, uh, the trait is really the central focus here, and it accounts for performance consistency across a variety of task tasks, and it's also the bridge between performance on the test and also performance in the domain. And in that approach, performance consistency is very important uh, but more importantly, we're talking about the correspondence between abilities measured in the test and the abilities engaged in the target language use domain. Well, the interactional list approach, I think, has gained uh, pretty widespread adoption in recent years, represented by Chappelle's work and Jacques Deville's work. Uh, although these two approaches differ somewhat uh, in their conceptualization of the role of context in construct definition, they, both of them, consider context as part of the construct, and they also recognize the context-dependent nature of some of the trait components. And both of them consider it a valid premise that the construct needs to account for performance consistency across a range of similar contexts. So I think that's a major distinction between this approach and the trait-based approach. 
So I'm going to use speaking uh, as an example to illustrate the application of this uh, interactionalist approach for summative versus uh, formative assessment here. Uh, and I'm just going to briefly review a, a few uh, models uh, to really set the stage for uh, my discussion here. Uh, and this is a model of oral communicative competence that I proposed at uh, LGRC in 2015. Uh, it's not very different from uh, previous uh, models, uh, but a major distinction is that this is a, a speaking uh, specific uh, model that is very specific to the modality of uh, speaking. Uh, and in this model, I try to highlight the hierarchical nature of oral communicative competence by separating the foundational skills from uh, the higher order skills. Uh, and I also argue that body language should be considered as part of the foundational skills as body language helps to demonstrate uh, these higher order skills like pragmatic competence, textual, and interactional uh, competencies. And if you think about the interactional list approach, uh, then I think based on some of our uh, empirical literature, uh, we understand that some of these trait components in oral <coughs> communicative competence are actually more susceptible to variation in language use context, such as pragmatic competence, uh, interactional competence, lexical uh, uh, competence, and automaticity of speech. Uh, obviously, you know there are other uh, uh, competencies that are also impacted by variation in um, you know uh, language use context here, but these are. Uh, the dimensions that uh, we have identified through uh, previous literature. And so when we talk about context dependence nature of some of the trait components, uh, and you know, but how do we even define construct, right? There are quite a few very well known schemes uh, to characterize context for real life oral communication in second language acquisition literature. Uh, and when we think about uh, defining context for assessment tasks, uh, we need to prioritize the inclusion of key contextual factors and focus on those that are prominent in representing the target language use domain and defining task tasks, and those that are likely to account for significant variation in both the quality of speech and also the features of uh, discourse elicited. Uh, and they need, also need to facilitate uh, interpretation of score-based inferences in relation to specific context of language use. And this is a scheme of uh, contextual factors of speaking tasks uh, that I proposed at uh, the RTRC conference uh, in 2015. And it essentially has a few layers of contextual <laughs> factors uh, including uh, language use subdomains. Uh, so if you think about the academic domain, we will be talking about uh, the social interpersonal, school navigational, uh, general academic, and discipline specific academic uh, subdomains. Uh, speech genres are relatively stable types of uh, utterances, such as everyday <coughs> conversational, uh, everyday narrative, etc. Goals of communication typically entail one or more speech functions. Uh, so it's, it's uh, really at a higher level than uh, speech functions that we usually talk about. Uh, medium of communication could be monologic or one-on-one -on -one or one-to-many. Uh, and the last layer here is the uh, characteristics of the setting. Uh, which include uh, spatial temporal uh, elements and also participants, uh, especially in terms of the roles that participants assume in uh, speaking tasks, uh, their social and cultural relationships, and in monologic tasks, uh, the intended imaginary listeners. <coughs> So if you think about our previous work on applications of the interactional list approach, it's really geared towards more uh, summative uh, high stakes assessment where the top priority is really to make inferences 
about performance consistencies, about you know language abilities that underline these performance consistencies, right? Um, but the implications of this approach for formative assessment uh, really haven't attracted much attention. But before we go there, let's just review uh, very briefly what is formative assessment and uh, you know, how is it different from summative assessment and how these differences actually motivate differences in uh, design issues and validation challenge for formative versus uh, summative assessment. In Black and Williams' uh, definition, uh, a formative assess an assessment becomes a formative assessment when the evidence elicited is actually used to adapt teaching to meet student needs. And Randy Bennett uh, identifies the uh, primary purpose of formative assessment in the educational context as assessment for learning versus assessment of learning as the primary purpose for summative assessment. Uh, although, you know, it doesn't mean that an assessment cannot serve any other secondary purposes, but if there's a trade-off between design features, uh, given, you know, the, uh, really these different uses, and then the primary uh, purpose should take priority. So in the rest of my talk, uh, I'll be talking about why would the same construct approach have different implications, have different types of assessment. And if we think about highly contextualized tasks, they are no stranger to formative assessment, right? We use them all the time. Uh, but in this talk, I'm going to talk about how to apply the interactional list approach more effectively informative assessment so that we can uh, really achieve its intended purpose. Uh, highly contextualized tasks are still a luxury in summative assessment and how do we encourage growing use of them uh, in large scale summative assessment and hopefully by talking about some of the design challenges and validation challenges, we can start removing some of the roadblocks uh, that could prevent us from really taking full advantage of this interactionalist approach. So first of all, uh, what are the differences in the construct definition? And if we think about uh, formative assessment is primary purpose is to support teaching and learning. And learning is dynamic. Right, so for formative assessment, we need a more fluid representation of the constructs. Uh, whereas in you know, summative assessment, uh, we are trying to provide a snapshot of a learner's knowledge, skills, and abilities at a, a given point in time. So there's this need to define major components of the construct and how they interact uh, with one another. But beyond that, for formative assessment, we also need to think about how knowledge, skills, and abilities are expected to change and hypothesize what might lead to that kind of change. And this is a very static uh, representation of uh, an interactional list approach to uh, construct definition where we have the subdomains, communication goals, uh, foundational and higher order competencies, uh, but no progression here. And the more dynamic construct definition for formative assessment would requires to understanding requires to understand what learning progressions would look like. And the interactional list approach actually puts an emphasis on both growth in foundational and uh, higher order skills and also expansion in capacity to apply those skills in increasingly complex language needs scenarios. So we can think of the learning progressions as providing the basis for both designing formative assessment and also recommending instructional emphasis and sequencing. But on the other hand, the information that we gather from formative assessment is also expected to provide uh, insights on how students develop their language skills 
and how we can use that <coughs> information to actually inform updates about the learning progressions, updates about uh, the instructional emphases. So, you know, if we think about uh, learning progression, really this, these increasingly more complex language use context, uh, in the mainstream literature, uh, we talk about really cognitive and linguistic demands of uh, language use tasks a lot. Uh, and recently, you know, uh, uh, researchers such as like Fulcher and Taguchi uh, have proposed this social cultural uh, uh, dimension of uh, uh, task complexity. And I'm going to start there. Uh, in Cummings' work, he makes a distinction between context embedded uh, and context reduced language use uh, tasks. Uh, so he discusses this distinction in the context of English language proficiency tasks for English language learners in North American uh, context. Uh, and he believes that um, uh, academic English tasks are more uh, cognitively complex, uh, but are uh, context reduced, whereas everyday conversational tasks are more context embedded, uh, but cognitively less taxing. And you know, obviously, I, I think there has been some, some controversy uh, around uh, you know, how he characterizes the contextual support and also uh, um, uh, cognitive demand of language use tasks. Uh, but this is one way to look at uh, really the contextualization of a uh, language use task. Uh, Fulcher and Ryder and also Taguchi uh, in their work to really add uh, this uh, pragmatic dimension to characterize the degree of contextualization. They focus on uh, how relative power of participants, social distance between them, and also degree of uh, imposition actually impact test complexity. And I would say for second and foreign language learners, uh, it might be useful to think about this continuum of neutral to highly charged context. And if you think about uh, you know, users' perceptions of uh, neutral or highly charged, it's really through the lens of a particular learner group. right? Uh, so what is perceived as uh, neutral, more neutral, would be more familiar to them, non-face threatening, and also the associated norms are likely to be shared across the learner and the target cultures. And as they move across the continuum, uh, then they would have less comfort, less familiarity, and more anxiety uh, to perform these tasks. So as learners progress, then they would expand on the language use context where they have grown capacity to meet communication demands. And if going back to the scheme of contextual factors for speaking tasks, uh, the goal of communication and also the characteristics of uh, the setting are the two layers that would most likely impact degree of contextualization uh, for language use tasks. The cognitive uh, complexity of uh, language use tasks has been pretty heavily uh, researched in second language learning uh, literature. Uh, and there are uh, you know, quite a few uh, dominant models there. Uh, again, uh, Cummings uh, characterizes cognitive demand as the amount of information that needs to be processed, uh, that must be processed simultaneously at the same time or closely together uh, in order to carry out a task. Uh, Skian uh, proposed this uh, limited attentional capacity model where he argues that second language learners have very limited attentional capacity, thus they need to prioritize where to allocate their limited resources. Uh, so he believes that there's this uh, trade-off between linguistic complexity and accuracy. Um, Robinson, on the other hand, uh, 
argue that uh, really functional and structural complexity go hand in hand. So when a learner is uh, required to, to really attempt a very complex task, he or she is actually pushed to produce more complex language and to be more accurate so that he or she can be more effective in communication. Um, so there are some uh, differences in their uh, perspectives there. But if you think about these cognitive uh, factors uh, that are uh, addressed in their models, I would say they mostly uh, relate to these uh, uh, really micro level uh, cognitive complexity sequencing uh, rather than uh, macro level. Bloom's taxonomy, uh, on the other hand, pertains more to the macro level of uh, you know, cognitive complexity sequencing. And we are all familiar with uh, these six uh, you know, major cognitive skills uh, uh, classified here. Remember, understand, apply, analyze, evaluate, and create. Uh, and you know, obviously, this model has also attracted some criticisms, right? Uh, and you know these cognitive functions are very broad, and uh, some researchers argue that they are not necessarily linear or hierarchical. Uh, and even within, I think, each cognitive function, we should be thinking about a whole continuum of cognitive complexity. So a more nuanced way of characterizing cognitive complexity both within a cognitive function and also across uh, would be very useful. So when characterizing uh, cognitive complexity and learning progressions, uh, first of all, we want to distinguish between cognitive dimensions that uh, inform micro versus macro level uh, sequencing. And uh, we want to focus on characterizing macro level sequencing for language learners uh, and allow enough flexibility at the uh, you know, uh, micro level there. And we also want to take into account the cognitive development of different uh, learner groups. And for young learners, definitely, uh, you know, their cognitive development stage need to be taken seriously when we uh, really specify learning progressions for them. For adult learners, that's a, a, a different story there because a lot of them have already developed uh, sophisticated cognitive skills in their L1. So we want to be cognizant that social and linguistic dimensions of task complexity are going to interact in very complex ways with cognitive complexity. And adult learners may not necessarily think that uh, defending an argument is more complex than, for example, describing a traffic accident there because of these uh, very complex interactions among the dimensions. Uh, linguistics, so what is the, uh, the language required to perform a language use task there? Uh, and if you think about our existing literature, it's uh, mostly reduced to uh, characterizing linguistic complexity in terms of the foundational skills I've just talked about. There's this whole body of literature, you know, accuracy, complexity, and uh, fluency. Um, but you know, I would argue that we should start thinking about how these higher order skills need to be featured in learning progressions for uh, English language learners. And adding the, the social uh, pragmatic solution, uh, uh, dimension to complexity, that's a, uh, a, a really positive uh, step forward in that direction. So uh, just a plug for uh, Norris's uh, new book, uh, and in their new book on designing uh, uh, second language educational experiences, uh, they provided a very thorough review of some of the key barriers in applying current findings in L2 acquisition order um, in the development of learning progressions there. Uh, and they pointed out that most second language acquisition literature on developmental sequences uh, actually uh, focuses on very small units of analysis, right? Like the acquisition of articles or tense. Um, 
and overall the literature doesn't support uh, any good understanding of how development sequences of these different linguistic dimensions actually interact with one another. Uh, and they also recognize that there's huge variation across individuals and also different learning environments, all of which could have a big impact on how learning progressions should be defined for different uh, learner groups. So when we talk about the progression of linguistic skills, we should never talk about them independently of specific language use context. Uh, so they should always be embedded in specific context uh, where they are uh, expected to apply their skills. Uh, and also learning progressions are local in nature, so there's no one-size-fits-all learning progressions for all learners uh, in the world. And we should take into account the learning goals, the learner characteristics, and learning environments of different groups. Uh, and we should start highlighting more the larger uh, linguistic elements and higher order skills in our learning progressions. Uh, even in some of these earlier stages of progression because these higher order skills could also be developed in different stages, right? Uh, so you could have different characterizations of the development stage for these uh, uh, higher order skills. Uh, and again, uh, I think it will be more productive to focus on providing evidence for uh, macro level progressions and allow enough flexibility at the macro level as long as there's no major violation of, uh, you know, no second language acquisition order, uh, we should be fine. Well, if you think about, you know, putting all three dimensions together, right, and characterizing learning progressions, obviously we are nowhere near really having a good understanding of how these three dimensions interact with one another, so we need a lot more research uh, into that. And also we want to recognize the fact that social, cultural, cognitive, and linguistic skills they do not necessarily develop in parallel for different learner groups. And take adult learners as an example, uh, and they may have very uh, advanced cognitive skills already in their L1, uh, but they may be still deficient in some of the linguistic skills and also social cultural skills uh, that, that will be needed uh, to perform a cognitive function there, right? Um, and also social culturally charged or more cognitively demanding contexts do not necessarily require more sophisticated foundational linguistic skills. Uh, everyday conversational skills, uh, they are, they could be very social culturally charged, uh, but they don't necessarily require more sophisticated, more sophisticated vocabulary or grammar, uh, but they could, could still be a challenge to many uh, foreign language learners. Uh, also, I think it is my view that when we think about learning progressions, uh, yes, we have these three dimensions of task complexity, but I don't think learning progressions should be driven just by complexity alone. Uh, the learning goals and the learning learner characteristics and learning environments should be considered uh, when we uh, you know, think about what will be a reasonable uh, achievable goal for learners at different stages. Well, I've just talked about uh, some key differences in the way um, this uh, interactional list approach can be used to think about construct definition for formative versus uh, summative assessment, and now I'm going to talk about some uh, differences in design challenges. And obviously for uh, summative assessment, uh, the accessibility of context to different test takers, that will be a major validity issue there, uh, especially for some of the assessments that have very heterogeneous uh, test taking populations, right? Like the TOEFL, IELTS, and some of these uh, global English language tests. Uh, and for summative assessment, there's this desire to use more contextualized tasks that have very
would you be able to broaden your inferences to contextual factors that are not represented in your assessment design? So uh, just an example, you could uh, you know, choose to represent uh, language use subdomains, speech genres, and goal of communication, uh, but decide to control for a medium of communication or characteristics of the setting, uh, depending what you want to prioritize there in your construct definition. While switching to formative assessment, uh, Early on, I mentioned this you know, desire to use more holistic, contextualized tasks that would allow users to demonstrate skills in action, uh, but we also know that these uh, um, contextualized, holistic tasks may not provide uh, a very rich diagnostic information there, right? So there are two approaches that, that you could consider to really expand the diagnostic value provided by formative assessment. And one way is to use lower level scaffolding tasks embedded in communicative tasks so that it provides some opportunities for you to have a good understanding of students' lower level skills, those building blocks for these more complex tasks. Uh, another way is to uh, augment uh, the contextualized tasks uh, with these uh, that allow diagnosis of more discrete skills, but the measurement of these more discrete skills need to be clearly linked to the building blocks that will be required to, com to, to complete these more complex skills, uh, more complex tasks, and they shouldn't be just tested in isolation without any clear linkage to you know, the enabling skills for the complex tasks. Uh, that have a communication purpose and, and, and goal. Uh, so now I'm going to switch to uh, uh, the topic of uh, differences in key validity issues um, that I've talked about, uh, some differences in the construct definition, in design challenges. Uh, and I'm not talking about just very general validity uh, issues with regard to summative or uh, uh, formative assessment. And here I'm just highlighting some validity issues uh, that are introduced, that would be introduced by this use of uh, interactional list approach, by this inclusion of context in your construct definition and design there. Uh, for summative assessment, uh, definitely the representation of the domain would be a major validity issue uh, given that uh, you know, uh, the more contextualized tasks are more complex to set up and they take more testing time, so you would only be able to include fewer of those um, given practical constraint. Generalizability, I've already talked about that, uh, and the fairness of contextualized tasks to different groups of test takers, uh, that would be a major validity issue. Uh, for formative assessment, uh, you know, obviously the alignment of the represented context with the curriculum and the learning goals would be of focus here. And if we think about the feedback coming out of formative assessment, we need to think about both uh, feedback on the linguistic skills that need to be improved and also the language use context where learners may need additional practice. And uh, I'm going to elaborate a bit more on the generalizability of the contextualized tasks uh, and also the usefulness of feedback for formative assessment. And if we think about um, really the generalizability of tasks, right, contextualized tasks. One of the most important uh, validity questions for us to ask is, how do we ensure performance consistency across parallel tasks, uh, across parallel task forms with these highly contextualized tasks, right? And we all know that in uh, you know, performance-based assessments such as writing and speaking, Typically, we cannot conduct equating uh, because we, you know, we can't use common items across different forms. They are memorable. Um, but you know, how do we ensure performance consistency there? 
Uh, and I think most of you are probably familiar with the ECD approach, right, to task design. So this is a very typical uh, ECD task model uh, where um, there are fixed, these fixed elements that are stable across parallel tasks for each task type. And there are also these variable elements that can be varied to produce parallel tasks for each task type. And when we think about highly contextualized items, tasks, uh, then you know, we need to think about which of these contextual factors we want to fix and which of these uh, we want to vary. And the variance for each further define and constrain each variable element. Uh, so, you know, for example, if you're one of the contextual factors you want to represent uh, is uh, setting, like office hours, right? And then, uh, you know, you probably want to define variance for uh, setting up the setting for, for that office hour and what is allowed and what is outside the scope. And when we talk about comparability of tasks across task forms, a, a very important concept is task difficulty. Uh, and task difficulty is a very uh, complex concept, uh, which is impacted by a lot of factors, like the characteristics of a task, uh, the method of a, a, a test, uh, rater, right, characteristics and their scoring, orientations and processes, uh, rubrics, and also test taker characteristics. And this is further complicated by uh, this other concept of test complexity, which is related to task difficulty, but it's also distinct. Uh, task complexity is typically indicated by analysis of cognitive, linguistic, and pragmatic demands of a task, and also uh, by linguistic analysis of candidates' responses elicited. And uh, there's also the perceived uh, difficulty by uh, test takers and also uh, test developers. So, as I said, given um, really the challenge of not being able to equate uh, performance-based assessment, we need to think about ways to support test com comparability and one way, as I just discussed, is through a very rigorous test design process, right? To really think about which of the ones uh, you want to represent in your task elements and which of the ones that, that you want to vary across uh, items of the same item type, across different forms. The scoring rubric actually could also be used as a vehicle to account for task complexity. So if you have different task types that are of different complexity, then your expectations for the same score level across these different task types could be different. Or if you have a variant of a task of a particular task type, uh, you could be using the same scoring rubrics, but you could be providing very specific uh, training, uh, rater training guidelines for specific tasks to further really uh, account for task complexity there. And uh, raters, uh, in their rating process, um, they, they should be given specific guidance as to how to compensate for task complexity so that you know, they can play a role in ensuring the comparability of tasks across uh, different task forms. And even if you have done all these due diligence, uh, still some minor differences in task difficulty uh, are going to exist. So we need ongoing research to really understand the impact of uh, different task dimensions on task performance so that you can feed that back into your test specifications to further uh, really uh, tighten up your specifications uh, so that you know, it's, it's like a, a, almost like a, a whole cycle, right? Feed it back, improve your test specifications, improve your scoring rubrics, improve your rate of training uh, so that we can, um, you know, do whatever we can to ensure test uh, comparability there.
And here are just some uh, examples of research uh, that can be conducted uh, to support task complex, uh, comparability, like analysis of repeaters' performance. Uh, experimental research that examines performance of a selected sample of candidates across different forms, or even experimental study where you manipulate some of the test characteristics and see how they actually impact um, the quality and also uh, the um, uh, scores uh, for different uh, groups. And Raider think aloud protocols to uh, understand to what extent raters actually compensate uh, for test complexity uh, based on the very explicit instructions that they are provided uh, in raider training. So I've elaborated a little bit on, on this generalizability issue of um, contextualized tasks for summative assessment. Uh, for formative assessment, the usefulness of the feedback is going to be of uh, critical importance here. Not so much for summative assessment because you know its primary goal is really provide inferences, uh, you know, make inferences on language abilities that underline performance consistencies. Right, that's the primary focus here. But for formative assessment, uh, I'm going to just um, unpack a little bit what does it mean by uh, you know the feedback being useful uh, and I think that uh, to be useful uh, feedback needs to be accurate, accurate and reliable uh, meaningful and also actionable and effective um, but when we think about accurate and reliable uh, you know Yes, I, you know, we want the feedback to be somewhat consistent, right? Uh, but I think we need to relax the, you know, reliability criteria here uh, for formative assessment, uh, you know, given that it's, it's not high stakes and uh, the, the impact is also, uh, it's, it's more on teaching and learning in which you could actually adjust uh, on a daily basis, right, very frequently. Uh, for feedback to be meaningful, uh, it needs to be represented in a way that can be interpreted accurately by learners. Uh, it needs to be relevant uh, to learners' learning goals. Uh, and also, the content and focus needs to be tailored to students' uh, levels and styles. And it needs to be at the right granularity. It can't be too general, otherwise it wouldn't be actionable but it can't be too dense or overwhelmingly detailed uh, so that the students are at a loss about, or teachers are at a loss about what to, how to use that information. Um, for the feedback to be actionable and effective, it needs to be uh, timely, uh, providing this indicator of language proficiency or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, I would, I would agree. Uh, and uh, if we, I mean, they usually label that as sort of a general proficiency test, right? Uh, and obviously there are these two approaches. You can either use highly de decontextualized tests and argue that it's a general proficiency test that could be used for any purposes. Or a more sensible approach would be you try to sample this general proficiency language use domain and include uh, contextualized tasks that uh, you know represent these subdomains to the extent that you can. Uh, I think that would be a, a more sensible approach, and not to mention the whole uh, washback effects on teaching and learning. Yes, you could probably make some, you know, uh, uh, provide some quick, dirty and, and uh, quick and dirty measures of language proficiency, but what would be the impact on teaching and learning, right? Uh, given the very exam-oriented uh, culture set that exists, that that I that we know exists out there, right? So yeah, I pretty much agree uh, that we should always talk about uh, applications of language skills in specific contexts. Like for me, I'm a, a really good case in point. I could give a lecture uh, on a very dance topic uh, in front of several hundred people, but if you ask me to talk about sports and sports and general election, I might uh, stumble, I think, yeah.
Um, so I do believe um, that, that uh, language skills are context dependent. Thank you, Shalmeen. That was great. Um, I was really interested in, the, in your discussion of learning progressions and the essential role they play in cognitive assessment. Um, you also, but when you describe them, you talked about how learning progressions are local in nature. They vary by learner group, by communicative goal. So I want to know, in your perspective, what is the state of the art in learning progressions in language assessment right now? Like, in language learning, I mean, what do we know about learning progressions, and what what do we still need to learn or research in that area? Right. I I would say not a whole lot. Right. Uh, and you're probably aware of some of the uh, perhaps researchers, you know, trying to. Uh, analyze some uh, uh, learner discourse from uh, communicative speaking tasks to try to characterize learning progressions there. Uh, and that's a very, very good start. Uh, but, but again, I think when we think about learning progressions, uh, uh, and I think uh, Nora's book made this very useful distinction between macro level and micro level. And I think a lot of that is going on actually focuses on really the micro level sequencing which could be useful uh, in a particular user context, uh, in, in a particular learning context. Um, but if you think about broad learning progressions that will benefit a whole lot of learners, uh, it's, it's probably less useful. Uh, and, and again, you know, our, our second language acquisition literature really focuses on these very discrete uh, linguistic elements, right? And so I think there's there's really a long way uh, to go to, to really develop uh, learning progressions, and we can't even actually agree on the definition of learning progressions. Are they supposed to be development stages, right? Development sequences, or uh, expected achievements of students at a certain stage, or uh, characterization of different proficiency levels, right? Um, so, uh, and I think we still have a, a very, very long way to go, uh, I would say. Yeah, uh, thank you for this fantastic uh, presentation. And just to segue a little bit on that, what it's made me think a lot about is, um, <clears throat> in relationship to learning progressions, would those learning progressions also be interactionalist in the sense that a student acquiring English in, for example, American school system is going through those progressions and getting kind of, you know, input that's very different than a student perhaps learning that in an EFL context in a once a week Saturday morning class. And so do we have to bring in an interactionalist approach to understanding learning progressions? Uh, definitely. I think that's why I'm emphasizing that when we define learning progressions for different learner groups, we really need to take into account the learning environments, right? Their learning uh, emphasis and, and also learner characteristics. And if you think about learning progressions for English language learners in the United States, it's not so much the, you know, take speaking as an example, it's not so much their everyday conversational skills. And a lot of these EL students will be able to master those within a very short period of time. Um, but, you know, what's really challenging for them is to develop these academic English language skills. Unlike in some English as a foreign language context where the learning emphasis has been different and their exposure has been different. Actually, the everyday conversational skills could be a challenge for these learners, right? So then you want to emphasize those uh, in the learning progressions so that they could be addressed earlier on and, uh, you know, with enough emphasis. So I, you know, pretty much agree that, uh, you know, there, we need to take into this, uh, take into account this sort of the locality uh, of our learning progressions here. Thank you to work. That's <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Charmaine. Uh, you um, touched upon uh, issues that we deal with uh, day in and day out. Uh, how would you uh, respond 
to a student who is in language training, intensive language training, every day for about eight hours for six months. Um, he receives plenty of um, formative feedback throughout the training. At the end, he takes the summative test. He demands formative feedback because he didn't make the score. What do you say to such a student? I'm sorry, he didn't? He didn't make the score. He oh. expected to achieve a specific score. Uh -huh. He did not achieve it. He's just, you know, a little bit below that mark. Mm -hmm. What do you say to the student who demands to have a formative map of what he should do next? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and I think that's really a, a bigger question about uh, really this uh, coherence between what is tested in your formative assessment and what is tested in the summative assessment. I know it's a huge debate uh, in, in really the K-12 uh, area in the, in the United States, right, uh, where, you know, with the reauthorization of the ESSA, uh, really thinking about really this summative through course assessment, this benchmark interim assessment and, and formative assessment, and how do you create really linkage across all of them. It can't be the case that summative assessment measures one thing and in your formative, formative assessment you're covering different skills and there isn't that uh, coherence. And I'm hoping that for that particular student, if he's in an environment, in a context where all these assessments are very well aligned with a very coherent theoretical approach, then uh, I think the, the feedback that he's getting from the formative assessment, the continuous feedback, that's going to help him or her in the long run to achieve the, you know, the expected level on the summative assessment. Uh, I don't know whether that uh, answer, answers your question. One more question? Yeah. Hi, Xiaoming. Uh, Hi. Thank you. Uh, uh, this is a very interesting uh, take on how the interaction, interactionalist approach um, can be applied to both formative and summative. This might be a little bit outside the scope of your presentation, mm -hmm. uh, but I wonder if you have any thoughts on how this approach um, might be considered with respect to assessment as learning, uh, dynamic assessment paradigms um, in, uh, as we move towards intelligent tutoring systems. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would think uh, it would actually have more opportunities there, right? Because if you think about um, really the both the states and also the frequency of assessment, right? Uh, and summative assessment, you know, less frequent, higher stakes. Uh, formative assessment, you can argue that it's ongoing, but uh, the reality is that, uh, you know, maybe they would only be able to administer a few formative uh, assessments through uh, a semester, right? But when it comes to assessment as learning and intelligent tutoring context, then I would think uh, this interactional list approach would be even more productive because then you don't have these, you know, constraints of uh, frequency of testing and, and, and all that, right? Uh, and, and actually assessment can be uh, really seamlessly integrated into learning uh, and where you know the, the whole purpose of learning is to improve their capacity to apply these skills in more complex scenarios and then uh, it's, it's very coherent with the, um, uh, the goal of the uh, ongoing assessment that is embedded in learning as well. And I would think that you know you would have more uh, opportunities uh, over there. Uh, for application.